But what's happening here? What I'm doing is I'm bringing the nail, this Al Nico member of the family, closer and closer to my magnet. Right now, it's in the green region where the magnetic field intensity is extremely low. As you can see, there is no interaction, no reaction between my magnet and my nail. Let's bring this thing very close, even closer to the brown region where we have a medium magnetic field intensity. Once again, no reaction, no interaction between the magnetic field and the nail and so we must try again we're gonna bring this nail even closer as close as possible we're gonna put it in the orange zone where the magnetic field intensity is extremely high let's see if there's any in oh there you go folks right there you can see the attraction between the magnetic field and the member of the Alnico family what is a magnet? A magnet is anything that produces a magnetic field. Does this produce a magnetic field? No, so it's trash. What about this? This is a neodymium rare earth magnet, so it does produce a magnetic field. Now, we need something to respond to this magnetic field, something that can show us that the field is there. Well, we need a member of the Alnico family. Atomic number 26. Is this a member of the Alnico family? No, trash. Is this a member of the Alnico family? Yes, this is iron. So this is gonna respond to the magnetic field created by these magnets. So first of all, we need to show the strength of the magnetic field in different regions. So we can break that up with this chalk. This right here, this is the area where our magnetic field is strongest. Farther out, our magnetic field is weaker, but still exists. Even farther away from the center, our magnetic field is extremely weak. This green region shows where our magnetic field barely exists. And anywhere outside of this green region, there is no magnetic field virtually. So let's go ahead, put our magnetic field right where it is in the orange region. This is where it has the strongest intensity. Now we're going to bring our Alnico member, uh, this little nail, and we're going to watch it respond to the magnetic field produced by these magnets. So let's start by putting our nail here in the black area where there is no magnetic field. As expected, there is no response from our nail. Let's put our nail in the green region where there is a very weak magnetic field. There's no response. In the brown region, once again, very weak magnetic field, hence no response. Now let's put it as close as possible. And there you go. You just saw the response from the nail created by the magnetic field from these magnets. Thanks. For Today we're discussing Faraday's law, which states that the electromotive force, aka the induced voltage created by a moving magnet is going to be N, the number of turns of coil, times the change in the magnetic flux over the change in time minus okay that minus is to indicate the direction of the magnetic field now what is this equation actually saying well here was the motivation behind the equation we know that if you have a current carrying wire that's an example of an electric field creating a magnetic field but Faraday posed the opposite question. He asked, can a magnetic field create an electric field? In other words, can I create an electric field without a battery? Can I create a current without a battery? And so this is the experiment that Faraday proposed. Coil of wire, which we have right here, take a galvanometer, which shows you the amount of current or induced current you have, and take two wires, okay? So we're gonna hook these two wires up between our coil of wire and our galvanometer. Faraday said, if I bring a magnet to the coil of wire, will I have an electric field? Will I have some current? And let's see. Well, no, there's no current. There's no electric field created. There's no induced voltage or induced current. But then Faraday did something magical. He let the magnet go and watch for some induced current. What just happened? What happened is we had this magnet fall through our coil of wire. So you had a changing magnetic field over a change in time, and that changing magnetic field created an induced current. An induced current created an induced voltage, which is your electromotive force. And so what do we conclude? We conclude three observations. Number one, the more turns of coil you have, the greater your electromotive force. Second observation, the faster you move the magnet through the coil of wire, the greater your induced current, the greater your induced voltage, the greater the electromotive force. So if I move my magnet very slowly, 
you'll see I don't have much of a change in induced current or induced voltage. But if I move it very fast, you can see the greater change. And finally is the strength of my magnet. The strength of my magnet determines the change in my magnetic flux. It determines this term right here. So if I have a very weak magnet like this one and I let it drop, you can see a very very meager change in my induced current as opposed to if I have a much stronger magnet and I drop it through my coil of wire well what do you have you have if I move this many times very fast through my coil of wire what do I have well I have alternating current and that's exactly what Tesla exploited in the 19th century now we're gonna check out the mathematical formulation behind Faraday's law let's go ahead and check it out we saw that a magnet can create a magnetic field and when you change that magnetic field inside some copper wires that can create some induced voltage and how do we know that we can check our galvanometer when I move this thing up and down you can see there's some induced voltage some induced current and some electromotive force now let's try to understand how this actually works First you want to do is look at your magnet, right? We've got a south pole, a north pole. That's going to indicate the directionality of our magnetic field. Now as I move my magnet, you're going to see the magnetic field change. I'm not going to do it yet, but just focus on the magnet. Now, as you look at this magnet, do you see any induced current, any induced voltage? No, I mean the light bulb isn't lighting up. In fact, if we check with our voltsometer, our voltmeter, then we can see there's zero voltage. But look what happens. As I move my magnet, I can see some voltage. And when I move my magnet in the opposite direction, the voltage goes in the opposite way. So when I move my magnet from back to front, it goes to a positive voltage. When I go from front to back, we go to a negative voltage. And so a stationary magnet, a stationary magnetic field does not produce any induced current or any induced voltage. But a moving magnet does create an induced current, does create an induced voltage. And what's more, you don't just need a moving magnet. No, you need a lot of coils. See, if I move my magnet through this coil that has only two loops, I have a, a, a bit of current, you know, nothing, nothing bad. But what if I move it through this one? This one has doubled the number of coils. So, what do you think will happen? Check it out, I'm maxing out my voltage just by increasing the number of turns of copper wire in my coil. And so what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is this. Let's go ahead and write down the three factors that influence your electromotive force. Number one is the number of turns of copper wire you've got. Here we had two turns, here we had four turns of copper wire and so double the number of turns means double the electromotive force and so your electromotive force Faraday found is going to be proportional to the number of turns of copper wire you have that's factor number one factor number two is the strength of your magnet we saw outside that whoa we saw outside that if you have a magnet with very little magnetic field like this tiny magnet right here this is not going to produce much of an electromotive force as opposed to if you have something like this this is much stronger and it's going to create a much stronger electromotive force so the electromotive force is also proportional to the change in your magnetic flux so the stronger your magnet the stronger your the bigger your change in magnetic flux hence the bigger your electromotive force and finally your electromotive force is going to be proportional to one final factor and that final factor is this it's gonna be how fast you move this thing. Check it out, if I move it very fast, uh, my electromotive force is gonna be much greater than if I move my magnet very slowly. So it's gonna be also inversely proportional to the change in time. And so it makes sense then that the final formula for the electromotive force is gonna be this. It's gonna be the electromotive force is equal to N times my change in magnetic flux divided by my change in time. And I'm just gonna put a minus sign out on the front to indicate directionality and this ladies and gentlemen is Faraday's law okay thanks for watching we'll check you out next time the ambition plus MKO
plus scaffolding equal yeah. learning. Excuse me. We believe anyone can learn yeah, anything. That's that. why our motto is oh, memorization oh, is a crime. That and that's why we partnered with Brilliant. Brilliant transforms math and science into hands-on activities so that you too can understand everything from first grade math to E equals MC squared. Barry Science Lab and Brilliant is your MKO and will give you the scaffolding to expand your ZPD until you become the next Sir Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein. Visit brilliant.org slash Barry Science Lab today. The first 50 of you to use that link will get a 20% discount on the Brilliant annual subscription. Don't, Don't forget, forget that you too can become, can become the next Einstein. Einstein. So, so let's, let's fall in love, love with math and science. science.